Hey, it's your old pal Lucid Stew again. We are continuing to look at the Federal Railroad Administration high-speed rail corridors. In this video, we will discuss the Keystone Corridor in Pennsylvania. The Keystone Corridor runs between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, through the capital of the state, Harrisburg. Pennsylvania is the fifth most populous U.S. state at 13 million people. The metropolitan areas linked by the Keystone Corridor account for about three quarters of the population of Pennsylvania. They are Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Harrisburg, and Lancaster. This corridor is currently serviced by Amtrak. The corridor is electrified between Philadelphia and the capital Harrisburg. Amtrak averages 55 to 60 miles per hour here with the top speed of 110 miles per hour. Harrisburg to Pittsburgh is slower along non-electric Norfolk Southern right-of-way. The Amtrak Pennsylvanian takes about seven and a half hours from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia for an average of about 45 miles per hour. Amtrak's immediate goal is to get travel time between Philadelphia and Harrisburg down by 15 or 20 minutes. As always in this series, we're going to skip the long iterative process the federal government favors and leapfrog straight to true high-speed rail. But before we start, let's review our high-speed rail guiding principles that will help us in attempting to build a reasonably competent route. Number one, separate passenger and freight, especially away from urban and suburban areas. This allows higher maximum speed and cuts travel time between destination pairs. Number two, utilize existing corridors. This includes passenger and freight rail as well as interstate highway rights of way. New rights of way will be necessary occasionally, but minimizing those avoids delays and additional cost from litigation. There are also utility corridors, but this would typically be a route which will make adjacent land cheaper rather than being able to use the corridor itself. Number three, fairly straight rights of way that are completely grade separated in order to maintain high speed and safety. Number four, avoid costly viaducts and tunneling if possible. We're just not great at performing either of these construction activities in the States cheaply although sometimes they are impossible to avoid. Number five, the core metro stations should be in or very close to downtown areas in order to move from density to density and foster urban redevelopment. I've gotten some pushback on this one, so let's say when it's convenient and doesn't cause excessive slowing of through trains. Number six, connect to existing transit to foster intermodality, bolster regional transit, and ease congestion on roadways or hearkening to number five as a means of accessing otherwise difficult and expensive urban cores. Number seven, connect to international airports near the route when convenient for the same reasons as number six, but also to increase the usefulness of the high-speed rail line to a given metro area and the region. Let's start with the stretch between Philadelphia and Harrisburg. It is owned by Amtrak, which simplifies things. In terms of speed, our main issue here is curves. There are many which restrict travel to under 90 miles per hour and some down to 60. Another issue is interaction with freight as Norfolk Southern has trackage rights on a portion of this right of way. That's pretty easily addressed. That section stretches from here to here about 20 miles. Best case scenario, upgrading the interlockings would take care of it. SEPTA also shares this corridor for 35 miles west of Philadelphia, but this poses few issues as nearly all of that right-of-way is four-tracked. While the Philadelphia to Harrisburg portion is grade-separated at all major crossings, the corridor is not sealed and still has one minor private at-grade crossing. If the corridor were sealed, this is what I figure are attainable average speeds as the track geometry exists. I'm assuming express service would be with Alstom tilting trains. 84 miles per hour on average is on par with Acela service. The eastern end of the Keystone Corridor is the Philadelphia 30th Street Station. The corridor also connects with the Northeast Corridor in this area as well. Philadelphia is serviced locally and regionally by the NEC as well as SEPTA. These transit services include heavy rail, light rail, 
regional rail, streetcars, and bus, most of which hook up at 30th Street. While not the heart of Philadelphia, the area around 30th Street Station is one of the most rapidly developing parts of the city. We talked about connecting to international airports when convenient. SEPTA already connects the 30th Street Station to Philadelphia International Airport, so no need to concern ourselves with that. Instead, let's concern ourselves with the curves between Philadelphia and Harrisburg that are a major impediment to higher speed. This one limits speed to 75 miles per hour, five miles west of the 30th Street Station. Can't do much about it, it's surrounded by development. Three miles further west are a couple of 2,000 foot radius curves, also limiting things to about 75 miles per hour. Take out half a dozen houses and the radii can be expanded to allow 90 miles per hour all the way through here. However, that is fairly pointless due to this approximately 60 mile per hour curve three miles further west that again can't really be fixed. The first 17 miles west of Philadelphia 30th Street is going to be 60 to 75 miles per hour and that level of speed is due to the use of a tilting train. Four miles further west, currently another 75 mile per hour curve. This can be improved to a 110 mile per hour standard with only adjacent property acquisition, perhaps demolition of one structure. This would bring about 10 miles of track up to 110 miles per hour from around 75. You pick up about two and a half minutes. Freight has also joined the right of way from the east in this area. West of that is another set of 75 mile per hour curves that can't really be altered and then we get to much faster parts. The speed limit through Coatesville is a theoretical 130 miles per hour. The next nine miles west are quite straight and would support 150 miles per hour or more, except for this curve. We're now out in open country, but the track geometry doesn't improve any. That is because the line must weave through some low hills and valleys. However, high-speed rail trains can handle grades up to 3.5%, while freight is generally trying to stay below 2%. It's not a problem straightening things out here with earthworks cutting through select hill crests and short sections of viaduct. It's possible to replace half of these roughly 27 miles of track with new sections containing 2.5 mile radius curves. This would allow an Alstom Avelia Liberty to reach its maximum tilting speed of 186 miles per hour for about 20 miles. Time gain over a tilting train on the current geometry would be about eight minutes. Track geometry through the Lancaster area can support about 130 mile per hour travel as this is one of the four metro areas of any significant size on the route. I like a stop here. A four-track station already exists, but could do with some minor upgrades and better land use in the area. It's about a 65-mile ride from here to Philadelphia and about 35 miles to Harrisburg. Lancaster's transit options are limited to bus service. There are a couple of 110 mile per hour curves just northwest of Lancaster. These can be combined into one large, approximately 150 mile per hour curve. There is a 90 mile per hour curve south of Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania, that can be straightened out to max speed of 186 miles per hour. This combined with five more miles of new alignment would keep a train above 175 miles per hour until it needed to slow for the Harrisburg station at a cost of about two dozen structures. This would be another 22 miles of near maximum speed travel, saving about nine minutes over the same train type on existing track. The right of way passes Harrisburg International Airport here, which seems like a tempting option However, Philadelphia International has plans to expand its number of gates considerably, and Pittsburgh International is overbuilt for its current use, so not much is gained with a station here. Let local transit handle that. Existing right-of-way would take the train to the existing Harrisburg station located in downtown. The Harrisburg area is home to about 600,000 people, 
and is served by bus transit. Amtrak ownership of the right-of-way ends north of the Harrisburg station and this becomes Norfolk Southern Territory. The Norfolk Southern right-of-way heads through the Appalachian Mountains largely along the Susquehanna, Juniata, and Conemaugh rivers. The route here travels through two different sections of the Appalachian Range. The first is a series of narrow valleys and ridges about 50 miles wide. West of that is an expanse nearly completely comprised of hills and canyons, which is 150 miles wide. Both feature numerous winding river gorges. Not exactly high-speed rail material. I judged it impractical to improve this route to high speed. Instead, I found the Interstate 76 route a little easier to smooth out. Interstate 76 runs through Somerset, Pennsylvania in a rare 20 mile long, relatively level section of terrain through this rough landscape. It still faces plenty of challenges, so let's take a look at what is possible along that route. There isn't really room in the Norfolk Southern right away to the north of the Harrisburg station to use that route, but there is just enough room to get underground and tunnel for two miles to US 22. Then immediately transitioning to the Interstate 81 right of way and crossing the Susquehanna River parallel to the freeway. For the first 11 miles of this option, speed is limited to 110 miles per hour due to several curves. The next 11 miles west can be increased to 150 miles per hour with six miles of new right of way avoiding the Interstate 81 to Interstate 76 transition. The Interstate 76 right of way is very straight here and fast until reaching the first Appalachian Ridge. This provides 22 miles of top speed performance. From this point to Pittsburgh, I tried something a little different. I started with a route that sticks quite closely to the existing right of way Interstate 76 in this case. Something like that would have a cost between Harrisburg and Pittsburgh of 11.7 billion. This would travel 207 miles at an average of 102 miles per hour for a trip of 122 minutes. That is achieved by traveling at around 90 miles per hour for the majority of the trip. Usually in these videos, we're aiming for a 140 to 160 mile per hour average. So let's see if we can eliminate some slower sections and get closer to that paradigm. We left off at the most Eastern Appalachian Ridge Interstate 76 goes under the ridges in a pair of mile-long tunnels. Our route would slow to 125 miles per hour for entry and exit curves. We will tunnel a little lower than the interstate tunnel because the grade is tricky with the interstate in the picture. This results in one two and a half mile tunnel with a 2% grade into the proceeding narrow valley and then another 125 mile per hour curve to rejoin the interstate right of way. There are several crossings like this, which act as both speed choke points and technical challenges. 125 miles per hour could be maintained for 10 miles next to the interstate, then slowing to 110 for the next ridge. A mile and a quarter tunnel would be required here, a little simpler with the interstate out of the way. You can see this valley is not flat, Conquering this would require a combination of earthworks and viaduct, but that's the price you pay for speed in a landscape like this. You might ask, why not stay at 125 miles per hour? That's totally possible, but more money. I'll talk more about why I've settled for this version later. Continuing at 110 miles per hour, the next series of ridges is the next challenge. The interstate crosses these diagonally at a grade that just barely works for rail. To go through this at 110 miles per hour, we'll need a couple of miles of viaduct on both ends to keep the grade reasonable with the straighter route. We'll also need a couple of tunnels, totaling about three miles to deal with hills the interstate steers around at lower speed. The grade coming down the west side near Breezewood, Pennsylvania is a little gentler, this combined with straighter interstate geometry affords a 125 mile per hour cruising speed starting at the ridge crest. 
This continues for 30 miles through three valleys and across two ridges. That is thanks in part to the upper reaches of the Raystown branch of the Juniata River, providing a ground level gap through the high ground. This condition ends because the route leaves the valley and ridge region, transitioning into a hillier area, then ultimately facing this escarpment, which must be traversed to enter the Appalachian Plateau 800 feet up. Improving upon the interstate route requires utilizing this sloping ridge line, a mile long tunnel, a 1200 foot bridge over a creek called Breastwork Run, and then a three mile long tunnel rising 400 feet to the surface, 11 miles east of Somerset, Pennsylvania, and then rejoining Interstate 76. All of this occurs near top speed, which continues to Somerset. Once in the vicinity of Somerset, the city constrains speed to 110 miles per hour for a few miles, picking up again to 150 miles per hour, and then back to top speed a few miles northwest of Somerset. It's worth noting that Somerset is the largest Appalachian town along this route with a population of just over 6,000, so no stops along this stretch. At this juncture, the route enters a formidable seven mile wide series of six to 800 foot high hills. The interstate navigates this with a couple of conveniently located canyons and a 100 foot deep mile long cut through the ridge. This would slow our train to 90 miles per hour. So one option is to drive straight through in a mile long tunnel next to an existing tunnel which the turnpike has abandoned. This range is navigated at full speed with grades under two and a half percent. The landscape to the west of that is extremely lumpy, full of low hills and shallow canyons and gorges, and this persists all the way to and around Pittsburgh and further still a third of the way to Cleveland before smoothing out discernibly. Immediately west of the aforementioned tunnel, the most reasonable path through the landscape deviates from Interstate 76 for four miles, which would require a couple of short viaducts and would slow the route to 125 miles per hour. One last range of mid-sized hills requires a mile-long tunnel to retain speed through the area. On the other side of those hills are the far southeastern outskirts of the Pittsburgh Metro. As the route enters the suburbs, it would slow further still due to a combination of sticking to the interstate right of way and diminishing returns when deviating. Near Adamsburg, Pennsylvania, Interstate 76 and our route enter a long gentle slope to the heights of the Eastern Pittsburgh suburbs. I'm utilizing the interstate here because the Norfolk Southern right of way is difficult and Pittsburgh's bus rapid transit system occupies what would have been available right of way nine miles east of Pittsburgh Union Station. At the apex of Interstate 76, the route encounters this small but prominent hill. I have elected to go around that at 60 miles per hour rather than obliterate it. Not much would be gained by going straight through and why not avoid this hill when everyone else has? At this point, my route transitions from Interstate 76 to Interstate 376. From there, the route wanders through the hills and gorges of the eastern Pittsburgh suburbs. The twisty route and grades as high as 3% would limit a train to 90 miles per hour. Near Frick Park, sharp curves would slow things further to 60 miles per hour. The route would then pass over nine mile run next to Interstate 376 and go underground next to where Interstate 376 does the same. Unlike Interstate 376, which emerges from the other side of the hill there a mile later, my route would descend and turn north under Interstate 376. It would stay underground for five and a half miles through two broad 90 mile per hour curves until ending at Pittsburgh Union Station. The Pittsburgh Metro is home to 2.4 million people, 
Transit options include an expanding bus rapid transit system, regular bus service, and a light rail system that runs underground in places. Because Pittsburgh's underground Wood Street light rail station isn't far away from Pittsburgh Union Station, I propose using an elongated underground high-speed rail station to bridge the gap between the two. This would extend transit access from the high-speed rail station into the southern suburbs. I'm going to take a pass on Pittsburgh International Airport. It's 17 miles from downtown Pittsburgh along Interstate 376 through some tough terrain. It would be pretty expensive for what you get, pretty slow, and the link is probably better served by local transit. And with that, we have managed a high-speed rail route between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So why did I like this method of developing this route between Harrisburg and Pittsburgh? Let's take a look at some travel times. Harrisburg to Pittsburgh, 201 miles at an average of 132 miles per hour for a time of 92 minutes. Philadelphia to Pittsburgh, 302 miles at an average of 129 miles per hour for a time of 152 minutes. Philadelphia to Harrisburg, 101 miles at an average of 121 miles per hour for a time of 50 minutes. Philadelphia to Lancaster, 66 miles at an average of 115 miles per hour for a travel time of 35 minutes. Lancaster to Harrisburg, 35 miles at an average of 143 miles per hour for a trip of 15 minutes. And Pittsburgh to New York City on an express, 393 miles at an average of 109 miles per hour for a time of 227 minutes. So there's a similar performance level between the two halves of the service, and I like the fit. Let's see what the price tag is for that. With regional cost difference considered, I have this Philadelphia to Pittsburgh upgrade at $19.4 billion. Keep in mind that is partially due to half of the current Philadelphia to Harrisburg route remaining unchanged and a switch to tilting trains for high-speed service, similar to Acela on the NEC. By comparison, the strict right-of-way option would be $7.7 .7 billion less and take about 55 minutes longer between Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. A no-build alternative is $19.4 billion cheaper and takes 1 hour 50 minutes between Philadelphia and Harrisburg and 7 and a half hours between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. Which is the better deal? Duke it out in the comments. Plenty more content coming your way. Stu's News is up next on the last Friday of the month, but we have more Federal Railroad Administration high-speed rail corridor videos and more high-speed rail city pair videos in the pipeline, so stay tuned. But that's all for now. Until next time, I'll see you on that big, beautiful freeway.